it's a pleasure to be here. And um, just a quick word about myself. Uh, I've lived in the Puget Sound since 1968 when I came up to go to college at uh, Pacific Lutheran University and then came to Seattle in 72 to go to graduate school at the University of Washington in political science. So I've been here uh, a long time and knew at a very young age, when I was 13 or 14, what I wanted to do with my life, which was to somehow make some kind of contribution, no matter how modest, um, to progressive social change. And that really uh, came out of my uh, faith community that I grew up in. I'm a Lutheran and uh, had the great good fortune of pastors who took uh, the Christian uh, scriptures seriously and didn't domesticate it. Sorry, is that better? Um, so I mentioned that because um, I have a kind of values perspective I come from, and for me it comes out of that uh, faith tradition. Um, so I've had a long time interest uh, in organizing, and professionally most of my life has been spent either as a lobbyist, which I think can be an honorable profession. Um, any of you know where the word lobby comes from? Uh, Nancy knows. I thought it was uh, U.S. Grant, but one of the two. When the railroad lobbyists would pursue them over to the hotel near the Capitol, the president would go to the hotel to get away from them, and they would come after him. Um, so uh, I have had a long interest in this, and about six years ago went to work for the United Food and Commercial Workers, which is the largest private sector union in the state of Washington. We have about 40,000 members. And uh, they started a community organizing department there, uh, which is unusual for a labor union. So in part tonight, I'm going to talk about community organizing um, and talk about organizing more generally, but also about uh, labor and uh, ways in which I think labor has to change uh, to be more effective and to be a um, uh, more full participant in that broad movement for progressive social change. To begin, I want to say some things about Wisconsin, which of course is recently in our minds. And there's been a lot of analysis done already of what happened in Wisconsin and why. Uh, I want to talk about it uh, just briefly in terms of a failure in organizing, uh, because certainly Citizens United and the uh, large amounts of cash that flowed in had their impacts. But there were other things as well. And since my topic is about organizing, I just wanted to use it as a bit of a test case. Um, the Wisconsin uprising, which it's been called, and I think was a legitimate way of describing it, it was kind of an uprising. Uh, it was beyond, at least initially, the conventional forms of political expression. Uh, originally, it was the teaching assistants at the University of Wisconsin and public school teachers who were really some of the vanguard in this. And uh, one of the teaching assistants, a, a woman named Charity Schmidt, who's in the sociology department, said that um, the uprising broke new ground because it moved beyond the interests of organized labor to address health care for all, voting rights, education funding and accessibility, housing rights, immigration rights, and so on. So initially it was very broadly based, and it attracted a broad cross-section of people. Uh, unfortunately, what happened over time is that the issues narrowed. And this same person, uh, Charity Schmidt, who made the comments I just uh, was referring to early on in the process, uh, later said that uh, she realized that even uh, early on, uh, this uprising was being co-opted and demobilized. And a telling moment for her came early on when the message of collective bargaining in the middle class became dominant. She felt that language, uh, the language in the capital, had consciously included all segments of society. So she's talking about the people that took over the capital in that rather radical act and were there day after day after day. That in the beginning they were talking about the poor and the elderly and immigrants and children and the whole um, mass of society. But as soon as they uh, started focusing on talk about the middle class, it began to fuel division and dissipate uh, the energy. So uh, talk of the middle class and saving and protecting the middle class is really current in our political campaigns. But I think it's interesting to think about what she's saying here that the middle class begins to exclude a lot of people and a lot of interests, or can, depending on how it's dealt with. So the first point I would make about organizing is that I think effective organizing has to cast a wide net 
It needs to encompass many issues to show people, in part, to show people the interconnectedness of all these issues. And the same system and systems that lead to the kinds of negative outcomes we see in our social, political, economic life affect uh, all sorts of people uh, in varying ways, but they come from, from a similar um, source. So it's important to keep the tent big, keep it broad, um, and continue to emphasize the connectedness of all these issues. Uh, secondly, there was so much emphasis on the attack on collective bargaining rights and media coverage of the Wisconsin experience. But Scott Walker was attacking much more than that. He was talk attacking the whole edifice of government. He was going after funding for K-12 education, higher education, children's programs, uh, poverty programs, the elderly, uh, on and on. He was trying to shrink government, to privatize where possible, to deregulate. There was a whole agenda. So it was about much more than just collective uh, bargaining rights. And what happened initially is that there was really creative, bold, out-of-the-box kinds of actions that were going on. I mean, as you think back, it was in many ways spontaneous. I mean, there was planning going on. But just this huge outpouring of people uh, over time. And Math Roth, uh, Matt Rothschild, who's the editor of Progressive Magazine, some of you may be familiar with it. It's based in Madison, Wisconsin. He was talking about how the Wisconsin uprising just crackled with life. And this is a great description. He said, I would look out my window three blocks from the Capitol and see people stream up the street every day for a protest. There wasn't just outrage and anger. There was jubilation. There was creativity. There was cleverness. There was fun. But there was also hard-edged slogans like, how do you solve the budget crisis? Tax, tax, tax. The rich. There was no concern about being accused of envy of these people. Uh, it was very bold and direct, but it was creative, and it engaged people. And uh, he feels that it really captured the imagination of people because they were trying these unconventional approaches. They were doing things that were mass protest. And then, unfortunately, um, people began to domesticate it. They began to pull in the oars. And so there were actions that could have been taken. There was talk of a general strike. Now, obviously, there were pragmatic reasons that they weren't, even, uh, weren't actually going to be able to carry out a, a general strike. But there were other alternatives. Uh, among them, uh, one suggestion was to have a rolling blue flu epidemic in which one, uh, workers in one occupation after another call in sick. You could have done something like that. Or working to rule, which in labor circles is when you have a contract and there's minimal standards you have to meet, just do what you have to do, the minimum. Uh, this is sometimes used as a way to uh, communicate with uh, employers. Uh, there's a variety of things that could have been done, but instead people drew back. So on the one hand, you had broad issues that connected people in the beginning. They began to pull away from the broad issues. There was very creative, bold action in the, in the beginning. They began to pull away from that. And lastly, where they went was to electoral politics, to conventional electoral politics. Now, you may have read that in the exit polling after the recall election on June 5th, they found a fairly substantial block of voters who were not comfortable with recalling Walker because they felt only malfeasance in office was uh, sufficient to recall someone. If you have a problem with his policies, boot him out of office in 2014. There's another regularly scheduled election. And I think that's an example of some of the limitations of conventional politics. You're playing by the rules set by the powers that be. This, of course, allowed Citizens United and all the money to come in because they were playing on their playing field. And so what happened, ultimately, is that uh, the Democratic candidate, um, Tom Garrett, um, moved to the center. He wasn't talking about any of the important issues at the end. His message was, I want to bring Wisconsin together. Let's everybody get along. It was very soft. It got away from everything that had ignited people in the beginning. And uh, just one last thing about Wisconsin. There was a meeting of We Are Wisconsin, which was the coalition, the broad coalition that coordinated the effort to try to recall uh, 
Scott Walker. And a person who went to a meeting just four or five days before election day said, the discussion burbled with talk of volunteers, early voting patterns, door knocking, mailings, making three passes at 535,000 phone numbers. That means three calls. Uh, analytics, television ad buys, voter suppression. It was all tactics. There was no mention of politics, no conversation about labor rights, the attack on democracy, the strangling of social welfare. Everything that catalyzed uh, the campaign had been lost that had catalyzed it originally. And the point was made that in the 16 months that this Wisconsin experience unfolded, they could have been organizing workers and the unemployed, building community groups, educating the rank and file on social history, democratizing union decision making, going door to door, I particularly like this one, going door to door relentlessly and patiently explaining how unions can increase everyone's wages and benefits but all the energy was spent on futile campaigns for Democrats who support austerity light politics, or policies, excuse me. And I find a lot of power in that analysis. That doesn't mean that I think we should abandon electoral politics. I'm gonna say a little more about that later. But we have to understand what is achievable and not achievable through that avenue. And I think the Wisconsin experience is instructive in that regard, that when people began to play it more safe, more conventionally, uh, bringing in the consultants, the people that supposedly have the experience. It's when it lost a lot of its energy. And it wouldn't have taken a lot to recall Scott Walker. But again, the issues go very deep, and it went beyond Scott Walker. And I think one of the unfortunate things uh, to this point, it doesn't mean it can't be recaptured, but the Wisconsin uprising initially spoke to these fundamental issues that cross class and race and the other kinds of divisions in our society. Um, so I know there's going to be a lot of soul searching about this, but I viewed it, particularly in terms of my topic tonight, from an organizing lens. And what was it about the organizing that fell short? And I think uh, this article that I'm referring to, which comes from a couple writers with Truth Out. Do any of you ever uh, look at Truth Out? It's a good online news surface. Um, I think they're uh, pretty much right on in terms of the shortcomings, at least in terms of, of organizing. So, uh, part of the reason I wanted to refer to Wisconsin, besides it being topical, is that I think it relates to my own um, labor union and what we've tried to do in organizing. So as I said, we're the largest private sector union in the state. So in our particular pond, we're not an unimportant actor. And the labor movement, um, how many of you um, come from a, a labor background in terms of being in a union or having family or familiarity? A few people. Okay, more than a few. That's good. Um, I know when I was a child, 35% of the workforce was union. Uh, now it's about 12. But my local, uh, I think, has tried to really think deeply about where labor has um, been misguided, where labor has lost opportunities, uh, the areas where labor should have been more assertive and more engaged and hasn't been. And they've tried to, our leadership uh, and our membership, uh, has tried to reshape how we do uh, labor work, organizing politics, the whole thing. Labor unions do some basic things. They uh, negotiate contracts, which is, of course, very important to the membership. And at the end of the day, when you're paying dues to an organization in a labor union, you look at the contracts you have and uh, how beneficial or non-beneficial do you think they are. So that's important to negotiate contracts. It's important to enforce contracts. Uh, we have staff members called union reps. Some unions call them business representatives. Their job is to go out to the workplace, enforce the contract, make sure employers are following the provisions of the contract, and so on. And for uh, workers that uh, are employed by large institutional employers, uh, I think it's fair to say that generally speaking, there's a lot of pretty systematic violation of contracts. Um, it's just the way things work. Um, I think one of the changes in our society with less people connected to the labor movement, or having less family or friends connected, is they're not as familiar with those kinds of, of dynamics. 
So it's important to, con uh, to enforce the contract, to make sure that it's being followed, because it's through the contract that um, a measure of justice is brought to the workplace. And one of the great uh, advantages of being in a union is that you have a voice in the workplace. You're not an at-will employee. If you're an at-will employee, you can pretty much be released for most reasons unless you can prove some uh, violation of, of law that you've been discriminated against in some way. But uh, with a labor contract, you have um, the protection of a grievance procedure. You have a voice at work. So it's very important. Electoral politics are important. Uh, labor unions, as you, I'm sure, are aware, get heavily involved. There's been a lot of talk about uh, part of the attack from the right on labor is to try to undercut uh, the single biggest source of money and person power, which comes from the labor movement in terms of progressive politics. So all of those things are important. Bargaining good contracts, enforcing the contracts um, properly so that workers are treated fairly and their rights are maintained, engaging the electoral policies, uh, politics so ultimately we can shape public policies that are beneficial. But our union has decided that the number one uh, issue is organizing, organizing new workers. And labor, um, after World War II, uh, kind of came to an accommodation with um, corporate America. Uh, what developed was something called business unionism, where it was all about developing a, um, a stable relationship with an employer. You give a little, we give a little, we get along, everything's okay. The adversarial nature, the essential adversarial nature of the relationship was lost. And I think uh, that's when you can begin to trace labor declining um, uh, in its importance. Now, when I say adversarial, it doesn't mean you have to demonize the employer. We have to understand we're all human beings. But there is a fundamentally adversarial relationship between workers and capital. That's what we believe in the labor movement. And capital will inevitably try to take advantage of the power differential it enjoys. When people ask me, why do we need labor unions? I say to me, it's very basic. Homo sapiens is a, is a species in which there's a power differential, if there is one. Normally, that uh, individual with more power will try to exploit the individual with less power. Happens in families all the time. Uh, women understand that because uh, they've been exploited and dominated by men in many cultures uh, for centuries. So it's really about establishing a power, uh, more of a power equality. So we believe that there is a fundamentally adversarial relationship, and we need to never forget that. And so just as in Wisconsin, when people began to become safer, more conventional, less bold and aggressive, the movement began to dissipate in certain ways. I think you can trace this history in the United States when labor began to think they could accommodate and come to sort of a detente with corporations. They began to lose that more assertive um, stance, which is, was really necessary to make important and significant gains. And it's not only in terms of the workplace, but also society in general. Uh, labor has had a strong um, history, when it's been at, at its best, of engaging broad social, political, economic justice movements. Um, and again, labor has a mixed history. It's also been beset by racism and classism and sexism and a number of other isms. But it's also had its, uh, its good side and often has been there for civil rights and economic justice and a variety of other things. So for me to say that our union places organizing as the number one priority, that does set us apart from many labor unions who have focused more attention on these other things, which are kind of management of the normal state of affairs. So that's number one. Uh, secondly, we've been very assertive about trying to organize our rank and file membership that ultimately, if we're going to be successful in our organizing, it has to be driven by the rank and file. So we have what are called stewards in unions. These are the workplace leaders. When I joined the union, six, or joined the union staff six years ago, we had uh, maybe 50 stewards who were legitimate, true stewards. We now have over 1,100. And that's been become, because it's been a priority. We've worked hard at it. And it's a wonderful thing to see people begin to discover their own power 
<clears throat> particularly if they haven't been used to standing up for themselves and others. So we have a very um, well-developed program for developing internal membership leader, uh, member leadership. We still have elected officers. We still have a hierarchy. Uh, with 40,000 members, there's a certain bureaucratic nature to our organization. But we also try to drive it from the bottom up as much as possible, which I think is another key to effective organizing. It's got to be embraced by the broad, deep uh, spectrum of people who are involved. Can you comment on why <coughs> increasing the stewards uh, has been effective? Why it's been effective? effective. I mean, you say your union has increased the number. And why having a larger number of student, uh, stewards is effective? Yeah. For example, in contract fights, the employer is ultimately trying to gauge the membership. They're looking at the workers. Every, we have bargaining that goes on sometimes for three months, sometimes six months, sometimes a year. The employer is always trying to take the pulse of the workers. What are they willing to fight for? What are they willing to settle for? If you have strong grassroots uh, member-led leadership, that sends a powerful message uh, to the employer. It also means that you can repeatedly take actions to clearly communicate to the employer that the workers are serious. Sometimes that may be petitions, sometimes it may be mar what we call marching on the boss. There's a variety of ways in which people can show that they're determined to be treated fairly. And you need to have that grassroots leadership. It can't be the staff. It can't be the president of the union. It's got to be your peers in the workplace because your peers have the greatest authenticity. That's another thing about Wisconsin. Some of the authenticity was lost uh, when they got away from the broad-based organizing and it went to the hands of consultants in the electoral po process. Um, the other thing about electoral politics, we continue to be engaged in it, but we had this conundrum, like many on the progressive side, where you would go to Democratic Party leaders and say, we'd like you to support this policy, they would not be very supportive. You express your displeasure at that, and they say, well, if you don't like us, you can go talk to Republicans, as if we have nowhere to go. And any of you who've lobbied, which I did for a long time, you would hear that kind of stuff all the time. You may not like us, but go talk to the Republicans. You think you're gonna be treated better by them? So what we've decided to do, and some others in this state, is to not accept that. Uh, there was an acronym coined for this, don't invest in more excuses. Uh, we're tired of people telling us in the Democratic Party, yeah, we're progressives, right, right, but we can't support you on this for that reason or this reason or whatever. So the strategy is really to recruit, identify, and recruit our own candidates, develop, develop people. This is what happened on the right. They started with school boards and things like that. We can do the same thing, develop leaders. Uh, who will engage and participate and be public officials. When we have an opportunity, uh, there's the option of taking out Democratic incumbents. Our union and others took out a state senator, a Democratic senator, up in Snohomish County in 2010. Oh, the party officials did not like that. We said, when you start acting like Democrats, then come and talk to us. We no longer give money to the party, to the state party, to the Senate or House caucuses, the Speaker is not happy about that. Money is power. And Frank Chop's done a lot of wonderful things, but we have our disagreements as well. And, you know, we continue to work with him, but we're not diverting money to his control to parcel out. We're giving directly to candidates. So there's a variety of things you can do to try to begin over time to change the electoral landscape. And so this is something else that we have done that I think is important, and others have joined us in that. Again, it's trying to think out of the box. You, have to, you can't be afraid. We're gonna take some short-term pain for acting this way in the electoral process, right? We're gonna take some short-term pain. But if you're gonna get long-term gain, you gotta be willing to take some short-term pain. It's just a fact. If you're gonna make change, there's gonna be some difficulty along the way. Um, the other thing I would say is that we constantly look for ways to uh, connect union and non-union workers. For us, a worker is a worker is a worker. The issues are the same. And often, uh, non-union workers end up getting pitted against unionized workers in a variety of ways. It's one of the oldest tactics of divide and conquer used by the right. So we try to find ways to connect and show the common interest. Again, 
try to get to that level of what, is, what are the systemic, systemic things that are causing all of us pain and grief in our lives. Uh, and again, sounds like a simple thing, but um, oftentimes unions, to their detriment, have been too focused on their own folks. So the mission statement of our local says that we are, um, our mission is to advance social and economic justice, both in the workplace and in the community. And by adding the word community, it sends a strong message, hopefully to others in our, in our state, but also to our own membership. And um, all of this stuff is aspirational, I might add, as a caveat. These are our aspirations. Uh, we fail constantly at these things. But I think it helps us make the right kinds of mistakes and ask the right kinds of questions. And I think it's better to make the right kinds of mistakes than answer the wrong kinds of, of questions. So I know I, you weren't going to speak to it, but uh, talk about this notion. I'm, Steve and I, for a while, participated in Sound Alliance, which tended to be uh, trying to bring together educators, labor, and religious people. Right. So what's this notion of connecting to other groups, uh, you know, as part of organizing the conference? This is exactly what I was going to get to next. Oh. So I didn't ask him to ask that question either. <laughs> so what I was just saying was trying to talk about some fundamental ways in which we're trying to do uh, the work of labor in a different way. The other part of it is what the work I do, community organizing. Very few labor unions have had community organizers. Some labor unions do a bit of community organizing, but it's usually done by some staff member that has 100 other things to do, and they slip it in a little bit when they have a chance. Our union actually created two staff positions, so they made a commitment in the budget to fund it. And budgets tell you what organizations care about, right? Where you put your money tells you a lot about what the values are and where the priorities are. So part of that is that we think of our members as whole people. And again, some of what I'm saying may seem almost so commonsensical as to why would anyone even have to think about it. But believe me, in the world of labor, uh, not everything that seems commonsensical is actually done. So for us, we think of our members as whole people. We know they're not just members of our union. They're not just employees of an employer. They are members of community. They live in communities. They're affected by a lot of issues. And so we try to work on issues that speak to their entire life. So we've worked on affordable housing, transportation, environmental issues. Uh, our union was the first union to endorse the Marriage Equality Act. We worked like crazy on it in the, uh, well, yeah, I didn't, wasn't trying to get an applause line, but uh, we pushed hard for it in the legislature. The campaign that's fighting off the referendum to repeal it is headquartered in our building. And that took some courage because we have 40,000 members, everybody from soup to nuts. When we do calling this fall, urging people to get out and vote and support it, we're going to hear an earful from some of our members. But it, it was something I, I take pride in that our, our uh, leadership decided this is the right thing to do. Uh, so we try to speak to a broad range of issues, and our members really appreciate it. We have an aggressive program for uh, helping people get their earned income tax credit for those that are eligible. You can get thousands of dollars a year in some cases. It's worth more to them in dollars and cents terms than what they get in an increase in a contract, right? So I think this has been appreciated, but it's a way to reach out to broader issues. We look for people in the community we can collaborate with who have common interests and values. And so we have probably 35 organizations we have ongoing working relationships with. Faith groups, health and human services, uh, environmental groups, um, human rights groups, immigrant rights groups, all kinds of organizations. If we can identify people who we think fundamentally are aligned with what we're trying to do in building this broader social uh, progressive movement, we will work with them. And these relationships are reciprocal. As I tell my, uh, my supervisor, I have to spend part of my time working on behalf of others, right? Because if you're going to have a real partnership, you've got to be there for other people. We're not in the interest, in try, uh, interest of trying to rent allies, which sometimes labor has done in the past. Hey, will you come to a rally? It'll look good if you're there. We try to have real relationships. And um, we, I, I would say we believe in something called social unionism, which is um, a term that's used a lot in Japan in their labor movement. 
But what it really gets at is you have to engage as unions the entire society, the entire social order. And you have to build relationships built on uh, mutual respect. Um, it's important to be present with people. So part of my work is being present with people, not asking them for anything, being with them, understanding what it is they're trying to do, and then discover ways to work together. And so for me, it's a great job, right? What could be better than engaging a wide diversity of people in the community? Uh, it reminds me in, uh, that human beings, I think, are more good than bad. Uh, most people have an impulse to try to, to do something that's healthy and constructive and of value. They really don't want to hurt themselves in most cases. And so we try to reach out to this broad cross-section of groups, and what happens in the end is that you can then build a much more powerful movement. And so, uh, again, community organizing has become a very important part of the life of our union, and it speaks to that issue in Wisconsin of drawing in the oars and becoming cautious. So when we're at our best, and as I said, this is aspirational. We don't always live up to the, what I'm saying. But when we're at our, our best at good old Local 21 of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, we are an agent in the community that's reaching out, that's trying to be creative, that isn't afraid of failing, that isn't afraid to take on established power, and you can take on people while still maintaining a relationship. And a lot of times, if you take them on, they actually respect you more. So it's a multifaceted kind of thing. But it's all based in this fundamental idea that workers need to gain more power in the workplace. That's the fundamental thing for us. And then we may need to make connections with others in the broader community on issues that affect the general welfare, that affect the whole society. I just want to finish real quickly by giving you one example of what this looks like, and that's our campaign against the Walmart Corporation. So you probably, everybody's heard about Walmart. And the United Food and Commercial Workers for 25 years have been engaged with Walmart in one way or another. And what we have done is we've developed a coalition called Making Change at Walmart. There's 25 to 30 organizations involved in the Puget Sound area. It's about making change at Walmart. It's trying to um, lead the company to improve their business practices. Just as one example, they have terrible health care coverage for their workers. They not only have terrible coverage for their workers, they counsel them to use taxpayer-funded programs. So you all have the privilege of paying for Walmart workers' health care. And they're told to go do that by their employer. And this is a company making $500 billion a year in revenue. Uh, they have wide-ranging effects, environmental, a lot of things. You've probably all read about Walmart over the years. So this is a community grassroots-based coalition. We're kind of the prime facilitator, but it's a real coalition. And uh, we are uh, taking a variety of actions to try to address Walmart's uh, strategic plan to come in Seattle and this, this uh, urban area, because it's the last uh, part of the country that they haven't gotten into is the urban areas. So uh, the exciting thing, too, about this is that we're organizing Walmart workers. People said, well, this could never be done in any way, shape, or form. It's going to be a long road. It's going to be years down uh, the way before we can potentially get them into a union, but they've created a workers' association where they t are taking collective action to stand up for their rights in the workplace. It's happening all over the country. There's hundreds of Walmart stores where this is happening. And it's exciting. And the workers are leading the way. They are telling the story. They are standing up for themselves. And Walmart is the all-time expert at intimidating workers. They have a SWAT team that flies around the country if they hear of any effort to unionize. Literally, it's called the SWAT team by the company. But the workers are standing up, again, discovering their own power. So I, I mention that in part because if any of you would like to get any information about what we're doing in this work, uh, I'd be happy to take that down when we're done tonight. Uh, I think you would find it interesting. It's an uh, amazing thing to meet these workers and to see the courage they have uh, to stand up for themselves. And it's another example of us reaching beyond unionized workers to the non-union sector and finding common ground and common cause. So I've probably taken a little bit too much time. Um, hope through some ideas out there that will be of interest for you to discuss in the small groups. Thanks.
Well, the first, the first thing I would say is that um, laborers, labor unions generally or labor unions in specific instances with specific employers uh, cannot solve all problems and control everything. Uh, some labor contracts have much stronger language about um, limiting outsourcing. Uh, but there's also, you know, we live in a capitalist system and there's a preponderance of uh, momentum in favor of the owners of capital. And so like in our, in our contracts, there are certain management prerogatives like uh, in retail industry, a big problem is cutting hours of workers. Uh, if you go into a retail establishment, you don't exactly have a lot of people helping you, right? If they could figure out a way to get you to stock the merchandise and take it off the trucks, they would do it, believe me. Um, so we can't do a lot about something like reducing hours. We can do things about how hours are allocated and that it's done fairly and uh, rationally and so on. But again, in, uh, an example related to outsourcing, the uh, Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union, it's called Unite Here, in a number of their contracts, they've got strong language about preventing subcontracting of work. Or if the, if the hotel is sold, uh, they have what they call successorship language, where you have to retain the union workers. There's a huge fight going on down now at the airport. You're going to be hearing more about it over the next two, three years, where they're going to be um, uh, putting up for bid contracts for a lot of the concessions and so on. And so we are in a big fight with the Port of Seattle, which likes to say that they're progressive. Uh, they are not, believe me. And they take $35 million a year of your tax money. Uh, there's a big fight about whether those jobs will remain union or not. So individual contract, individual contract. In this particular instance, there's obviously a history of how that contract has evolved over time. I don't know the particular union. I don't know exactly what their resources have been to uh, strongly uh, address that issue. Uh, but again, there, there are limits on what unions can do, uh, but there's a lot that they can do. And I was trying to make the point earlier that when unions fight for better standards in the workplace, better pay, better benefits, and so on, working conditions, it does have a spillover effect to non-union workers. Uh, non-union workers benefit from the sacrifices and the efforts put out by union workers. Uh, the reverse is true. As union density has declined, in other words, as there's been less union workers um, as a market share in a given market, it's had a depressing effect. That's why Walmart, you know, is such a big issue. 10% uh, of, um, I think 10% of what comes through the Port of Seattle is Walmart. Just one employer, right? And if they come into Seattle and they uh, have their workers, a lot of them making eight, nine bucks an hour, they'll tell you the average wage is $12 an hour. It's a lie. They, they simply lie, right? And they, they, they try to get away with that. They will depress wages for the whole retail sector. Um, so it's, it's a case by case thing. Some labor unions are more effective than others, you know, just to be honest about it. Some have more, um, more effective leadership. Uh, some have a stronger base of uh, workplace leaders. That's why we've worked so hard to develop stewards. Because again, at the end of the day, the, the employer is looking at those workers and what they're willing to fight for. Uh, I think your hand went up first. Well, I saw conflicting data on this. What was reported initially was 37% of union members voted for Walker. And then later, there was polling done by Peter Hart, who's a respected pollster. And he found that like 26% of union members voted for Walker. What I will say, again, labor has a broad cross-section of people. We have absolutely arch conservatives who are a member of our union. Uh, and it's interesting, what we try to do is focus with them on the issues that are in their self-interest as well as the self-interest of their fellow employees. And so what will often happen is you'll have people um, who, you know, they will actually be active union members and fight for good contracts and so forth. Then they'll turn around at the ballot box and vote for somebody who's passing public policies which undermine them. So this is an ongoing educational process for, for us with our members. But we do have a way of intentionally and kind of systematically having communication with members regardless of their political point of view. And I think for our more conservative members, 
to the extent the union can improve their conditions at work, say they get into a grievance situation where they think they've been treated unfairly, if the union comes in and helps them resolve that in a way that's to their benefit, that can sometimes begin to move people in a little bit different direction on other issues. But just because you're in a union doesn't mean you're um, of any particular political stripe. Although for any identifiable demographic group to have well over 60 people vote Democratic, that's pretty significant, right? Because this is a very divided country. In Seattle, we live in a bubble. You know, let's be honest about it. We live in a bubble. Things that seem obvious to us are not self-evident to a lot of other people, right? I think, Joshua, you're next. Well, I think, you know, I think cooperatives, I'm not an expert on cooperatives. I think they obviously have a place, uh, a role to play. I believe, though, uh, again, as I said earlier, uh, so many of the workers in our society uh, find themselves in workplaces where they're dealing with a big differential of power and they need some way to organize collectively to try to begin to redress that imbalance of power. So I think unions can exist uh, along with cooperatives. Uh, we're never, even at the height in 1955, it was 35% of the workforce that was union. That meant 65% was not. Uh, but that 35% had an outsized influence on the general social welfare of the country. So, you know, we're pretty eclectic that way. Uh, I think unions have a very, very important role to play in, in many sectors of our economy. And that's why the right is attacking them, attacking them so viciously. They understand that. They understand our power better than a lot of people on the left understand it. Uh, I think this was next, this person. I think it's a both and. I, I like to uh, work in terms of both ands rather than either ors. Um, it may seem like tinkering, uh, sometimes with contracts, but it has real impacts on people's lives. Uh, and so I think uh, negotiating as good a contracts as we can in, in workplaces is an important thing to do because it affects people's standard of living. It affects the level of stress they face in the workplace. And the level of stress in the workplace affects their whole life. It can have these wide-ranging effects. It's also a place where people can begin to understand what it is to collectively um, organize and work together. When I talked about our union focusing on community organizing is an important component, and this is something labor needs to do more, that's getting to the broader questions. Labor has skills that it can share with others, just as others have skills to share with labor. Like I said, the great thing about my job is I get to interact with all these different people who have different perspectives and interests and insights. We were talking in our group about the importance of how language has been really controlled for several decades by people of a more conservative persuasion. And I believe that ultimately these issues are about values. That's what people resonate to most fundamentally. I've I said it in the small group, I've said it before. A lot of people don't vote their self-interest. The reason polls go back and forth so much, you know those independent voters in the middle, this is kind of the image of everybody's in a toga thinking great thoughts, I'm an independent voter, I'm a pragmatist. A lot of those people don't know the hell what they think. That's why they go back and forth. They criticize ideologues for being rigid. Well, at least ideologues have tried to systematically think about a coherent point of view, right? Every position has its strengths and weaknesses. So uh, I think that speaking to values, again, people respond to their aspirations. And you know, this perennial question about why do all those white working class voters vote for politicians who systematically attack their interests economically? It's because they identify more with the, those officials. They think they're more like them, right? Think back to the 60s. The whole world seemed like it was coming apart. Those women were, what were they talking about? You know, what were they un unhappy about? The black people, the, the environmentalists, well, who are these people? You know, man is about, and man is about dominion over creation, right? Um, the eld well, in those days, it was the gay liberation movement. It's become more complicated. All of this stuff scared a lot of white Americans, okay? And if you look at the voting, the exit polling, it's white America that disproportionately supports the forces of the status quo and the, the forces of control and domination. And I'm a white person, I'm a white male, I think I can say that. 
Um, it's people that look like me, right? And so we've got to find ways to reach out to people that look like me and help them understand you're being exploited by these people. But we've got to get to the value level. It's got to be, we have a lot more in common than you think. So that's, again, labor can play a role along with the whole progressive coalition in creating spaces. What's the common good cafe? It's a space, right? It's a space to talk. Now we need a much more diverse group of people, right? It'd be great to, to bring some arch conservatives from somewhere. Let's get them here and talk and find out we're not so bad, you know. Uh, we're not immoral. So that's part of what has to happen. So it's got to be both. Both the micro and the macro, I would argue. I think, Jeff? Well, again, our union has a not insubstantial number of people like that. So we have opportunities to have those uh, conversations all the time. And I think it, it gets back to trying to identify areas of commonality. You know, let's talk about what, what do we agree about? Uh, part of it is just getting to know people. That's why I mentioned creating spaces for people to come together. I mean, uh, the um, Industrial Area Foundations, the Saul Alinsky uh, organizing stuff, Sound Alliance is part of that. Their whole thing is about relational organizing. It's creating spaces for people to come together, and it gets tied into narrative, to personal history. As you begin to talk in certain ways about your personal history, you begin to find out, oh, there's some commonality there. Uh, so. It's a slow process, but it's got to be very intentional. People have to commit to it. And that was one of the reasons I was drawing the contrast between our union. And again, please understand me. And I'm not trying to say that we're great. But I think we're at least trying to do some of the things that need to be done. And what really helps us is engaging this much broader community. The key challenges of workers in Seattle? OK, uh, well, it depends what sector you're talking about. But a lot of workers are facing reduced hours. That's a general problem. Uh, many employers, like Macy's, one of our employers, were in contract negotiations. They're systematically trying to move to a, a part-time workforce. So reduced hours, which leads to reduced benefits, a loss of retirement security. Only 15% of workers have defined benefit pension plans anymore. More and more. You know, Rob McKenna is talking about moving new state employees to a 401k, okay? So I would say reduced hours. I would say loss of benefits is a big concern. And then I would say the other thing is that so many of the, the workers, you know, it's different if it's in a small business, but let's say an employer of any size. So many of them have moved from local and regional companies to national companies. And so I would say a lot of workers feel a great disconnect between management and themselves. They don't feel, it used to be the head of QFC, the CEO. He'd grow up in the grocery industry, he worked in the stores, he'd go out to the stores, he'd talk to all the employees, he knew what it was like to work in the grocery store. Now you got guys in suits in Cincinnati, Ohio, who treat the workers as units of cost. And workers feel that. Then they have these stupid slogans up in the break room about we're all one big frickin' happy family. You know, and that just breeds cynicism. You know, they know it's not a family. So those are basic issues, and there, there's many others. Uh, just a minute. I think, the, sir, in the back, you, and I'll get to you, because I know your hand's been up. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I really can't speak to that. I don't know what the exact circumstances were. I can tell you that labor law, when the Wagner Act was passed in 1935, what it basically said is that organizing collective bargaining is a fundamental right. An employer should have nothing to say about it. It's up to the workers whether they organize. If they, if they get organized into a union, then management can enter into the collective bargaining process and do its darndest to get the best deal from their point of view. Labor law has progressively become more and more difficult. Uh, it's very, very difficult to organize now. There's all kinds of restrictions on what labor unions can do. In the old days, you could have wildcat strikes and you could have secondary strikes and all kinds of things. Uh, most of that's been made illegal. So one of the challenges in rebuilding the labor movement, and I would argue it would be a fundamental part of building uh, a more progressive society, is making labor law more fair and equitable. Because that's really a, the legal vehicle through which people can come together to try to change their uh, circumstances at work. Yes, sir, you had your hand up. Yeah, That's a good suggestion. And what it speaks to me about is we try to not make things too personal in the work we do. Uh, like with employers and so forth. 
we try to talk about systems. And I mentioned this in our small group. What every organization, every institution has its own internal logic, right? It drives towards certain things and not toward other things. Doesn't matter how good a person you are. We sometimes will talk to the store managers in grocery stores. It's not about you. You may be a fabulous human being, but you're not making the decisions in how this business is run. It's being made in Cincinnati, Ohio. And if you don't manage it, they'll get somebody who can, right? Now that doesn't mean that variations in personality and basic human goodness can't make a difference in a workplace, but there's limits. So I think when we talk with people about these issues, it's helpful to not try to come across as if oh, I think this other person is just the most horrible person in the world. Most people don't like that. What we can talk about is how do these institutions, how do these organizations operate? What is the logical outcome of the way they're set up? We need to change those things. You know, and so that's why I can I have a lot of respect for many conservatives. If they're principled and they're thoughtful, they bring insights that people on the left don't have about the human condition, right? But it's important to, to depersonalize it in that way. At the other side, the really personal part I think we have to do is try to connect with people at the value level and find our common humanity. At the end of the day, if we can't find our common humanity, we're going to be these little atomistic individual entities, and uh, that's only going to lead to destruction. So thank you very much. It's been a privilege to be with you tonight. I appreciate being here.